Okay, I guess I can start. Uh, can you hear me down there? Okay. If if sometime I start to go low on with my voice, please uh, just hire me. I try to raise it again. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Evan Butera. I work for Wellnet, a little web agency here in Milan. And today I will try to give you some little tricks uh, to improve front-end performance. Uh, this talk comes from both me and my friend Ruben. He's uh, another Drupal developer. I've met him uh, in uh, Drupal Camp Transylvania, and we start to work on this mess. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy. Uh, this will be a kitten-free talk. So if you are a cat person, please leave immediately. OK, perfect. And I guess we can start talking about WordPress. OK, no one leaving, so I don't have Drupal fanboys or Drupal engineers here. That's fine. Uh, then every one of you more or less knows what front-end is in some way or another. And I guess we can start. We can start saying the base thing. Uh, Front-end performance is the 90% of every website. Uh, I don't want to have Drupal engineers here because they will start to fiddle me with, oh, but Drupal cache is awesome. I know. I already know it. <laughs> but we are talking about something else. Monkeys. This is uh, our end user. Think about it. Every single customer of yours is this one. What? The point of this talk is uh, we are developers, we are builders, we are designers. And uh, we must feel responsible for every single one of our end users. No, not just for the one who pays us, but uh, for the monkey. Every single step in our work, in our journey for a project, change their experience. And we are making their web. And we must put them in front of the building process just because they are not clever, they are not expert, they are not inclined to learn new tricks as we can be. And now some base knowledge, so you can start ignoring me. Every one of you knows how a browser works. And one, perfect. Two, two, we have two. Okay. Uh, every, some one of you have ever tried to unfold the code uh, that makes Chrome? It's a fucking mess. Okay, uh, basically, when we deliver a web page, also sorry for my accent, if you didn't understand, I'm not uh, native English, so try to be forgiving. Uh, every time we serve a web page, the browser has four steps to deliver it and to make it available to our end user. It starts converting our HTML into a DOM uh, tree structure, the representation of nodes that we declare in the HTML. And this takes time. This takes a fucking amount of time because uh, in HTML5, he must try to repair every single broken tag we live, we live around, and uh, he will try to set things in the right order. So, first step in every reasoning about performance, produce light and clear HTML. That's the base, okay? It's nothing new. He will then try to parse our CSS with the DOM tree to generate the render tree. It's a basic representation made of colored squares of how our document is made. 
the render tree will take into consideration only elements that are, that are visible. So it will skip the head of our document, it will skip every display none element, and also every element that doesn't have a geometry, like uh, fixed and absolute positioned elements. Then he will start to lay out our page. He will start to put every single render block inside our document, giving him a dimension. Browsers are clever, usually, uh, Safari, IA, um, and they will try to use a, a dirty bit system to mark uh, parts of the tree that need or are, have been modified. So they don't need to relay out the entire page if we change just one small thing in a single div. This makes them somehow faster. Uh, this, and I hope uh, even down there you can see it, is uh, the Gecko layouting process. As you can see, it starts creating every single DOM node in just simple squares, rectangles, around the page. And then it will start to modify the reposition once after the one after the other until the page is fully loaded. This was really slowed down. Ah, okay. We have some rules in CSS that affect the layout. If you want to take uh, to write it down, uh, basically everything that changed the geometry or the positioning. Uh, will uh, trigger a layout uh, process inside your browser. And this takes time. Then the last process, the paint process. Basically, the browser will take and give color and light and whatever shiny you have made on your page and deliver it uh, to the end user. It's a recursive process as the layout one, so it will start from the top of the document, it will go down to the last div, and it will go back up to redesign it. Other property of the CSS will trigger a paint process. Of course, if you trigger a paint process, it will be less uh, heavy on the browser than a layout process. Now you are bored. Okay, we're okay till now? Okay, perfect. Uh, performance is a matter of milliseconds. Performance is not a single golden rule, a Drupal model that I can install and my website will be fast as hell. It's really a collection of really minimal things that maybe doesn't give you a gain uh, in the order of a millisecond. But if you sum a lot of them up, you can start to have a, a website that is delivered in less than a second. And that's what we want. Have you ever tried uh, here in Italy, maybe in the underground, to open Drupal.org? I've tried yesterday. I was uh, between here and uh, Garibaldi. It took uh, more or less seven and a half, and a half a second just for the home page of Drupal.org. And it's not a fancy team. It's not a fancy website with a lot of animation uh, and whatever. And think of that on an uh, e-commerce project. Me, as a customer, I will try to find someone else who can deliver the content immediately, not wait uh, 10, 15 seconds. Now, how do we measure performance? <laughs> really, actually, this is uh, kitten-free because I cannot find uh, two cats in this position. <laughs> we have a ton of metrics. Really, they have uh, like 25 acronyms to describe how fast your website can feel. I don't give two shits. Uh, Basically, the most important things 
are how fast is the first byte to reach your browser, to reach your client, so we can start actually downloading the things we need. How time it takes to fetch all the dependency we have, all the assets, CSS, JS, and whatever you want to stick in it. How time it takes uh, for the user to be able to interact with your website. Again, Drupal.org, seven seconds and a half just to have a screen, and the menu wasn't able to be opened for another three or four seconds. And then the page load time. Uh, how much time does it take for our page to, fully to be fully loaded? We have a ton of instruments. And I hope uh, down there you can see this line, but in case I will try to read it. <laughs> but it's a consulting, so maybe messy. Uh, we have a ton of instruments. They are basically mostly inbound in our browsers. Uh, from there, we can see, uh, a uh, example, Chrome has a really nice timeline. It can show us uh, when every single asset is downloaded, when every single JavaScript is start to be interpreted when every single image is painted. Okay, that can be really useful. An FPS meter, again, in Chrome, what it will say to you? It will tell you that uh, your page, uh, if it stays on the 60 FPS, is fluid, it's reactive. If the FPS uh, rate drops to 30, 15, like when uh, someone triggers uh, 25 jQuery animation all together, uh, that means that the user is just looking at his phone and thinking that he is broken. Paint flashing, another thing that you can enable in your Chrome browser, it will show you uh, flashing boxes whenever you trigger a paint uh, process. This is useful, again, why? Because you know that the browser is working. You know how much he is working and you know how to tweak your website so it doesn't work so hard. Layer borders, again. Every time you animate something, you create a new layer that is passed to the GPU, usually. How many layers you can have? You don't know. It depends all on the device that your user is running on. The more layer you create, the more the GPU is used. The more the GPU is used, the more battery you are using, the more uh, bus you are using between the GPU and the CPU. So you must keep them at a low number. Right? Clear till now? And then one thing I found, strangely, only in Safari, composite borders. Composite borders tell you, basically, when you animate something, uh, how many times you upload the texture to the GPU. So if you make uh, a little ball that is moved around and it changes color between uh, red and blue, every time you change the color, changing the background color um, uh, on the CSS of that uh, element, you will upload the texture. And that will start to fill the memory of the GPU. OK, for now it may seem uh, not too clear. I have some demos after. OK, other thing I need to drink. I speak too much. We have also a website that can analyze our project, PageSpeed from Google. And actually, and this is Drupal.org. OK? And uh, PageSpeed also has a, a CLI interface if you want to install it and run a node on your machine. And then we have a web page test, another uh, huge chunk of data. You need to uh, basically, you have markers for what we are doing good, what we are doing bad, uh, and the usual stuff. You just need to navigate it uh, and try to understand what they are trying to tell you. Uh, I still don't understand the half of the stuff there is displayed on this page. 
and also this as a huge CLI application, and you get uh, a JSON that can fill this room, I guess, for uh, every single website. And feel free to try it. Uh, you won't understand too much. I don't, at least. Uh, then, what we have to make uh, our projects faster? Big pipe. The new revolution in Drupal. Big pipe. You don't know how fucking hard it is to find a monkey wicked pipe. <laughs> you really don't know. I spent like three hours. OK. Reduced version of big pipe, because if you want, there's a talk uh, just made in the last Drupal uh, con. It's like one hour and a half of talk that explain you exactly how big pipe works and stuff like that. Uh, it takes our page, it destroys it, it makes uh, little chunks of pages, and it starts sending placeholders to our user, and then he will replace the placeholder every time a single chunk of page is ready. That's it. What does it change? It changes perceived performance. The page takes exactly the same time to load as a standard Drupal, uh, standard website, uh, whatever. But, and you have already seen this, I know, it will feel faster. The main content is delivered immediately. It's cached content. But you take the same time to load the full page. Everything that cannot be cached is not a problem. It will be delivered separately after. But your main point is to deliver content. And you actually don't care if the user can see his own information in the sidebar. You actually need him to see the products you are selling. You actually need him to see the article you are promoting, right? OK, big pipe uh, will be included in Drupal 8.1. There is a huge article on Facebook. Feel free to check it. And as I said, perceived performance. That's the most important thing you have. You can fiddle with the code until a certain extent, you can't go more than that. You are still working on a mobile phone. You are still working with someone using an old mobile phone or a BlackBerry or whatever. You can give it uh, all the content, but you need him to fill it fast, or he will just uh, change the page. Then, refreshless, or also known as Turbolink. There is another huge talk <laughs> from the same place, another hour and a half about. And basically, what refreshless does is uh, uh, he used Drupal cache tags to see when you click an internal link if a region is changed or not. And in that case, uh, it will just uh, swap the content of the region instead of reloading the whole page. That means you don't need to download again your part of the CSS. You don't need the full page load. You don't need a full layout. You don't need a full repaint. And that is fast. Or at least you can perceive it as fast. Wow, nothing jumping. OK, it integrates Turbolink. Uh, it increases your perceived performance. Again, perceived performance. It is in uh, alpha something state. Uh, it requires uh, a core patch to work at the moment. Feel free to help. And it works at a region level for now. Uh, the plan is to make it work uh, on a block level in the next time. But still, it's fucking amazing. Uh, then start to think about uh, big pipe plus 
Turbo Links. I guess this is your face. And okay, now I've removed all the modules and all the Drupalism uh, from this talk with those two slides, and we can go on uh, with the front end stuff. Okay, uh, as I said before, there is not uh, a golden rule for performance. A lot of simple tricks to improve the whole project. That's the thing. One thing you maybe don't know is that conditional comments actually stop the rendering of your page. If you are in Chrome and you have an EA something conditional comment, uh, Chrome will start to download that asset. It won't use that asset, but it will download it nevertheless. That means you are slowing down the whole thing. If, and actually there's a nice article, I put the link in there, uh, about how they discovered this thing. If you put an opened and closed conditional comment on top of your document, Chrome will just work fine. Yeah, that, that's silly, I know. Uh, DNS prefetch. You know that every time you try to reach an asset on a different domain, like, uh, I don't know, uh, you like to use uh, a CSS from someone else and you need it to fetch it from another domain, uh, your browser will need to check the DNS and then uh, understand uh, where he needs to go and then wait for the T time and then go. Okay, if you use DNS prefetch, you can find about it uh, on uh, MDM. It's really simple. It's a link uh, rel prefetch. Okay, in your head with the domain you need to reach. When you start loading the page, he will already start to check for the DNS in, instead of waiting for the asset to be declared and waiting to get it. You should always defer anything that is not critical. Uh, is your whole website depending on jQuery? I mean, if I go on your website uh, and there is not jQuery loaded, I still see some content. I guess yes, right? So jQuery is not necessary for my website. It has some quality of life improvement, maybe. So I, I can actually defer jQuery or toss it all together, maybe. But uh, <laughs> you can defer and uh, let load after the full page is loaded, anything that is not crucial for your project. This will give the end user the feeling that the page is fast. Same thing, always the same thing. Again, concatenate assets, minify them, gzip them, that's Drupal already does half of that stuff. And if you can, use a subdomain. Uh, browser can connect to a small chunk of um, can download a small chunk of assets from a single domain every time. Maybe he has two, maybe he has 10 to five, 25 connections, but still can't reach them all together. If you split all your static assets, not the CSS, please, not the CSS, uh, in different domains, and you prefetch them, it will gain uh, a lot of time in the order of milliseconds. Still, now, everybody loves to have nice fonts on his project, right? Perfect. Uh, my designer is there. If you want to kill him, thanks. Uh, because, uh, oh, this project uh, needs to have this claim with this web font and this other claim with this other web font, and the button will have uh, five different web fonts. One for each letter. Uh, what? What? Oh, no, we need to support EA6. Uh, <laughs> OK. Uh, custom fonts actually uh, block the critical path. The critical path is actually the stream that brings the content to the page. If you stick uh, 25 Google web fonts inside there, uh, we can uh, see your page tomorrow, yes. Uh, you can 
However, find some way around. Uh, you can stick to uh, basically two bad things happening instead of uh, blocking the whole page. You can choose to make the text that use that web font invisible, or you can choose to have a fallback, a fallback for, that web, for that web font. It's all on the declaration. Uh, flash of invis invisible text is actually something I won't uh, recommend because it's fucking ugly. Uh, on the other end, on the other end, uh, flash uh, of unstyled text will trigger both a paint and a relay out uh, on your page. That means when the font is loaded and you declare, an, I don't know, a monospace as a base uh, font because you don't have any taste, um, the font gets loaded. He will just change the whole bunch of uh, fonts, and uh, your text will start increasing and getting higher, and it will be quite a mess. There is some way to work around this, and it's font face of server. It's a tiny, clever JavaScript. Uh, you can declare the fonts you need. He will listen for them to be fully loaded, and then like magic. He will uh, stick a class on top of your document telling you, okay, this font is loaded. And then you can actually have control on what is happening. Maybe you are working on a website that needs to be really fast. And in that case, uh, you can say, okay, I don't care of web fonts uh, on my mo for my mobile users. Then you can detect if uh, the device is mobile and avoid to use that class and avoid for the device to resettle everything. He's working on a desktop computer, oh, fuck him. OK, it's quite simple, actually. And also, you can use uh, session storage is, if you are sophisticated. You can also use a cookie to see if uh, uh, the font has already been loaded and is already cached inside the browser. Make sense? OK. This is actually me when I work. CSS performance. Oh, CSS are bad for internet, period. Because uh, as I've shown you before, CSS stops the rendering of the page until the browser has fully unfolded all your CSS, and they've decided that uh, this span has uh, these rules and this div has those other rules, he will just stop and keep working without, without giving you any kind of feedback. Uh, there are some general best practices, call, call those like that, uh, like uh, linting your CSS because why not? So you can avoid having uh, stupid mistakes around. Uh, leave the uh, vendor prefixes to something that uh, is actually automated and made for that, like an auto prefixer. You can run it uh, on any kind of task runner, even broccoli. Uh, why this? Because, uh, for example, Bootstrap. Uh, includes a shit ton of vendor prefixes that maybe you are not targeting. Maybe he is pointing, uh, is giving you a vendor prefix for some kind of browser that you don't want to support with your project. So in this way, you can stake to the bare minimum you need. Again, if uh, someone uh, uses Bootstrap, but no one uses Bootstrap in production, right? Uh, you can use something like NCSS. And CSS will take your page, check the assets, and see if there is something that you don't use. And tell you, hey, guy, dude, sorry, uh, you have like uh, 200 kilobytes of CSS you don't use. What do you want to do with that? Keep sticking it in your main CSS. I guess it's not that the answer. And uh, serve your CSS as soon as possible, like uh, head CSS. Okay, this will make it feel faster. 
as I said before, uh, whenever you change something CSS, uh, is that via jQuery, via JavaScript, or whatever, or I don't know, mm, something magic, uh, you will case, uh, you will trigger one or both of layout and paint project the process process. Uh, if you can stick a bunch of rules all together and change them all together, you will trigger the process only once. Uh, like uh, add a class to the top of your document and change it all. Progressive announcement. I hate progressive announcement. It's really something that I really hate. But it's good for performance. You can still make the things work on the, on the old clunky browser. And you can still have the new coolness because the old IE will just ignore it. So can be a good try. Um, again, we have seen before how a browser composed the page. The more specific a CSS rule is, the more, the more DOM nodes it must traverse to stick the rule to the node. So the less specific, the faster. Uh, yes, we have Twig. Uh, yes, blah, 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 yada, 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 yada. Uh, Sometimes you don't want to make an extra template. Sometimes you have a form that you don't understand why the module author have made it like that. You don't have a, a way to make a fast and cheap template. Uh, if you really need to make bad CSS, uh, try to avoid the usual chain of id my monkey dot my monkey dot this is a monkey and whatever that ends with the 37th selector. Bam. Uh, this can seem not really related to performance, but it actually will decrease the specificity of your CSS, so it will make uh, things easier for your browser. You have one class that declares one rule, and that's it. Uh, you can work on BAM to make it even faster, like avoiding this uh, class pollution. You have already seen some project with um, BAM, this is my element, BAM, this is my element uh, red, and this is my element big. OK, that's shit. Uh, you can use uh, the SMAX. Uh, um, state uh, declaration, like is a something. And uh, you can actually use uh, attribute selector to define a whole bunch uh, of rules that are shared by the same block, by the same element, yada, yada, yada. That will make things faster. Uh, it's already 10 minutes. Uh, OK. And then you can use, uh, well, of course, uh, prefixes because CSS are bad and have uh, a global scope pollution. And uh, you can use uh, at suffixes. Uh, that's the guy from CSS Wizardry is coming out with this thingy. Uh, you can declare uh, and and you must escape it in your CSS uh, with a backslash, of course. Uh, and at the rule to declare at which media query he will he need to behave in a different way instead of overriding an entire block. Uh, I will try to explain that after. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> That's I know uh, it's ugly. It's ugly as fuck. I know, but it works. And that means lighter CSS, smaller file. Yeah, 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 monkey. We are okay until now. Someone has collapsed. No. Okay. Perfect. Uh, and now, another thing, critical path CSS. Uh, you need all your content, you don't need all your CSS. When you load the page, when I load the home page of Drupal.org, I don't give a shit about the footer. I don't need the footer CSS. I just need the part that I can see, the above the fold stuff. So I can uh, decompile my CSS into a smaller chunk that is like uh, around eight kilobytes. Why? Because uh, every call uh, can fetch up to 14. 
So if you stay between the 6 and the 8, you are mostly sure that you can have all the CSS you need in that small chunk of text. And I can stick them in line in the head of my document. So when the page is served, it's immediately ready. I don't need to fetch the CSS, process them, and whatever. And then I can defer the remaining CSS. They will be loaded uh, after a while. But I don't actually care for them, right? The page is already visible. I have already delivered my content. Uh, there is a, a simple, uh, you just need to write on your Google uh, critical CSS. You will find an NPM module. You give him uh, the website address, and he will uh, take out uh, the critical CSS you need. Uh, you can then take your uh, HTML, .twig, uh, whatever, and stick them there. And then uh, you can use a clever script called load CSS. Uh, you actually need to make a huge chunk of reprocess function because you need to declare every single CSS that you are loading inside this script so we can handle the loading and pipe it. Or you can actually uh, use, ah, uh, I'm missing a word, override <laughs> uh, this method uh, inside the module. But that's not really my, my thing. Uh, my boss just said to me, hey, there's a model for that. So, OK. Uh, you can set then a cookie or use session storage to know if actually the CSS has already been loaded, so you don't have to download it again. It's uh, really simple. You have uh, a fast rendering, ever on a slow connection, that can cause flash of content if you are not clever enough uh, tailoring your layout around th this technique. And you need to have some more fiddling with JavaScript, but the result is awesome. Uh, but actually, it's not for every kind of project. If you're making your grandma blog, uh, you don't need it. Actually, I don't know why your grandma has a blog, but... OK, file and libraries. Uh, Drupal 8 has libraries. Libraries has, are nice. Uh, even nicer because you can tell to every single chunk of HTML you are going to style to use exactly that chunk of CSS. And Drupal will just uh, take and concatenate everything and send him to the front end. And the smaller the piece of CSS you can create, the better. This is how to defer a CSS file. This is a chunk of code from Nicolas Bevilacqua, if someone of you have heard of him. He's quite a JS thingy maniac. Uh, you basically stick uh, inside the no script uh, your actual CSS, and then you load it with JavaScript. That's why I said you need to pre-process the hell out of it. And don't ask me why, but it works. If you, uh, in this function, you basically recreate the uh, link element, if you declare the media like something invalid, it will just work. <laughs> OK, now, JS. General ticks, uh, I integration for a linter, or use it on uh, something like Gulp, so you can avoid stupid mistakes, uh, reduce the variables, reduce the functions, and of course, defer or async. You can actually defer or async as an option inside the Drupal libraries when you declare your team. Uh, little pitfalls to avoid. Of course, JavaScript uh, is easy to optimize. You just don't need to make huge functions that makes 225 things all together. Uh, and that's the first step. Uh, first of all, optimize the node selection. When you interact with the DOM, don't try to use jQuery, this is my monkey, and whatever. Just use a simple selector. The simplest, the better. You will have uh, one way to get to the element you need, and uh, JavaScript will be faster. He will need to transverse less nodes to get to the target. 
uh, store references to every node you need. That means uh, if you need to declare uh, JS my monkey as the target of your function, just stick a var before it. It will just save inside the memory a reference to that node, and you will be able to use it again without needing to transverse again on the fucking DOM and get it again. Okay? And then uh, if you need to, I don't know, make a widget, uh, you click something, a person widget with your grandpa or with your grandma in topless, I don't know. Uh, build the whole thing together and then append it to the DOM. One layout, one paint. It will just live inside the memory of the browser until you have appended it and then it will be rendered. One single pass. And again, DOM changes must be, or should be, applied together. Dependency, avoid them. That's it, okay, the talk is ended. Uh, think twice before adding whatever library if you just need a function. Think about jQuery. Think about jQuery. You are actually keep using jQuery just because you like the dollar sign to select things. You can do the same thing with like five types more in base plain JavaScript. Am I right? Am I wrong? Uh, someone can say me, oh, I use that for Ajax. Good, you can do the same thing with the same quantity of code. Just open, I don't know, W3School. Uh, you find the chunk of code you need, copy it, paste it, you're done. Uh, actually, in Drupal, it's an heresy to say that you can uh, avoid jQuery because jQuery is tailored inside the main process of uh, JavaScript for Drupal, so it's quite silly when I hear Morton Decay say you can uh, avoid it, but still. Uh, event bindings. Bubbling uh, is a bad thing. If you don't control the bubbling of your event, you mean, I mean, you click, the click event will transverse the DOM up to the head of your document. Uh, if you don't control it, you can incur in some performance issue, like uh, triggering stuff that shouldn't be triggered. Uh, you should try to avoid uh, elements that are fired constantly. Uh, you're already triggering uh, a repainter relay out every time you resize the, the window, every time you turn uh, your phone. That's why it's clunky when you turn it. Uh, so if you start sticking stuff to on resize or um, on mouse move, you will just keep triggering and triggering and triggering the function. And of course, unbind, uh, unbind every, ele every event you don't need. Uh, they use memory, a huge chunk of memory, because there is something listening to, oh, the user have made this, <laughs> like a little dog. Uh, okay, then, uh, stop me if I'm going too fast, but I, I have like 102 slides, and I have 40 minutes, so, and I have got too many coffee, so, okay. Uh, I've said already, don't make a huge chunk of function that does 200 things altogether. That means don't nest iterators. If you can, avoid to nest iterators because you, you will just use an exponential quantity of memory every time you trigger the function that have nested iterators. And uh, you should uh, try to move from the switch cycle to the use of a literal and uh, the has own property because they work, they, they give the same exact result, and in this way, you can actually skip the non-enumerable properties. Uh, same thing. Mm. Okay, the line after. And if you iterate on an array, you can use a, a while cycle using a decrease counter. It will gain more or less the 30% of performance on... Uh, Basically, any browser except Chrome, I don't know why, but that's it. Single responsibility. Again, the huge function of uh, jQuery you have made before. Toss it away. Okay. Uh, <gasps> okay, I'm 68. I can, I can rush to the end. Uh, 
try to build a small function, small chunks of JavaScript that does only one thing. You need to uh, handle your off canvas menu. OK, one single function. You click the button, you trigger a class. That's it. You don't need to actually animate the menu inside the same function. You can call it after. And Drupal 8 library is actually works quite fine for handling all this mess of small chunks of JavaScript. Test. Uh, every one of you who fiddle with PHP run test, I guess. So why don't on JavaScript? Because if you have a memory leak, you find it on a test. And they are fucking simple to put on. You just need something like uh, Karma, Chai, and Mocha. And they take really a small amount of time to get used to and to write. Uh, you know, if I go in, produ in, in production with something, I want to be sure that it works, but also that it doesn't make my iPad crash. So, OK. It's cute, right? Uh, device detection. Device detection can be done with browse cap. OK, that's it. Uh, bad thing, a browse cap, the module of browse cap isn't, hasn't been ported yet to Drupal 8. There is an issue open if you want to come to help. You're looking at me bad because I know BrowseCap is a library. You can integrate it in our way. But monkey see, monkey do. There's a model for that. I put the model. Things work. Works. That's model. Uh, but we have something that the team layer allows us to do for a really simple device recognition that is using a regular expression on the user agent. It's really minimal, and it's not so reliable. But if you use something like critical path CSS or a font loader, you can use this to understand what you are running on and load the stuff accordingly. Of course, people have already made it in a chunk of ways. Uh, the problem is it's actually not that reliable. You can use it uh, to improve basically the performance if you are deferring basically everything. But in a mobile uh, focused project where you can't actually have access to um, Solid device recognition, this can save you a lot of time. And then uh, another way is to use something like Modernizer to detect features running inside the browser. But the problem is uh, uh, Modernizer is quite heavier than a simple regular expression. So it's a choice between something fast that can sometime fail you or something a little heavier that will give you a result. OK, till now? Well, no one is gone. Perfect. Images. Uh, and this is actually a golden rule to optimize images. Don't use any. OK, uh, use SVG. Use SVG, automate the sprites in, in SVG when you can, because usually the guy that makes a Photoshop or Illustrator things will make a mess. And you also will get uh, automatically the CSS for that sprite using an, autom an automatic tool. Uh, prioritize SVG over any other format, if you can. Of course, if uh, your customer needs to support EA6, uh, fuck him. Uh, <laughs> And where possible, try to use CSS. Like you have uh, really simple icons, uh, try to make them in CSS. You are already downloading your CSS file. You don't need to download another asset. Uh, try to run every image on the team with something like uh, ImageMin. You can't have the full control over what the uh, content editor will put inside the, mm, the website. 
so you can't force them to oh take this console thingy and run uh, this command and they will just look at you like eh you mad bro and also uh, another thing if you have really small images uh, this will make your page a little heavier but you can actually use base 64 images uh, it will make everything faster because you are fetching less assets, uh, even if the page is heavier. But I mean, really small, like 14 for 14 icons. Uh, there is another way to serve uh, huge, nice, uh, beautiful images in just the way that Facebook does. You can serve uh, using a preset in Drupal and uh, low quality image and uh, use a blur filter over it so you see a blurry thingy that more or less is similar to the image you are loading instead of the main node content and then load the actual image javascript always uh, you don't actually need the uh, yeah i know i have five minutes i still have 20 slides or so <laughs> okay uh, you don't actually need to serve every time uh, retina images think before it and also, you can try to serve uh, 1.5 per images. They will look as nice as Retina on both sides. And also use the picture element and animation. Everyone wants nice animation on his website, right? I know I have five, but I will take it. <laughs> OK. Uh, animations are tricky, because you don't have uh, a single way of doing it, them. And also, neither of the ways you can do them are far superior to the others. Like, uh, most of the time, CSS3 is just faster. But uh, uh, something like Greenstock can be even faster on certain cases like uh, uh, fixed position SVG animated with Greenstock are fast as hell. Uh, absolute and fixed position elements that get animated uh, doesn't trigger the layout, uh, the relayout process of the browser. So try to animate whatever is, uh, just to stick it into absolute position. Opacity, translate, rotate, and scale. And scale. Uh, use the hardware acceleration of your device. So basically, they are faster as well. Uh, translate will trigger the paint process. Top left animations will trigger both the paint and the layout process. Uh, Three, more or less? OK. Uh, this is a simple translate, if you can see it. Two minutes, OK. It, it's really simple. OK, you see, it's moot. Uh, I can assure you, I don't open the console. And, uh, it's running at 60 frames per second, OK? And uh, this is the same thing with a top left animation. You see, it's not clunky. It's basically the same in this small animation. But here, we are on 57 frames per second. You don't perceive that, but you actually can see, not here, but there, a little trail after the, the Drupal 8 logo moving. That means if you are animating like a, a chunk of stuff, you are oversaturating the GPU and making the, the um, browser work as well. So if you can stick to translate, it will be just a little bit faster. OK. Uh, I, I will uh, skip questions. Uh, if you want, you can come at the WellNet booth. So. OK, perfect. I have uh, five more minutes. Uh, GIF animations uh, can be rep done with CSS and Sprite using a step keyword for the uh, repetition, for declaring the repetition. Uh, 
And this is actually a demo I have stole from Lia Veru. And it's basically a sprite with 10 steps. And I'm just animating the background image. And it's fluid. It seems like a GIF. But it's like uh, one and a half time uh, smaller. Again, less assets, less stuff I'm loading. And actually, you can have 20,000 GIF on your project. You stick them all in a single sprite. And you can animate each one of them without any issue. OK. Animation on SVG. I see someone. You're right. You're alive. OK. Uh, animations on SVG. You can animate SVG with uh, CSS3, but you can animate like the paths. And that's quite crappy. But they are lightweight. So if you just need to take an SVG and move it around, OK, it's fine, CSS3. Uh, JS, like uh, XAP, Greenstock, uh, as I was saying, or the Snap library, can give you an absolute control on uh, the file of the SVG file you are animating. And they are actually really fast. And uh, Smil, uh, I wouldn't uh, point my money on Smil because uh, it's going to be deprecated. But uh, it outclasses CSS3, so if you don't need a future-proof project, you can use it. Uh, want to see demos or I go on? No? Perfect. So I guess I am boring you. Uh, <laughs> you can actually force the GPU usage. That means uh, you are making your animation smoother because it's not all a CPU work. Uh, using, uh, uh, for example, Translate 3D on the CSS side, using uh, Animator transfer Transform on this mill side, and Force 3D on Zap, for example. This will actually make uh, your animation always on a 60 frame per second. It will feel smooth as fuck. Uh, when you use any kind of animation, you need to take into consideration something that is the bandwidth between, between CPU and GPU are really limited. So if you start sticking uh, a lot of uh, GPU-accelerated animations inside the project, it will just become clunkier and clunkier and clunkier. Uh, you need to consider the GPU as a sort of cache. So it has a limit. And the more you upload to that, uh, the more you will slot your project. The texture upload is uh, quite of an issue. Every time you change uh, aspect of the paint side of what you are animating, that thing, those pixels, are sent directly to the GPU. So you are consuming more and more memory. You should always try to reuse every single layer you open. When you stick a translator 3D to an object, that creates a new layer for the browser. If you can, hide it outside the canvas and then reuse it. So you won't uh, upload again stuff on the GPU. And of course, uh, it burns the battery. Last thing, service worker. Uh, there was yesterday, I guess, a talk about service worker. It was really fancy. And uh, I won't explain you exactly how to set up a service worker and whatever. Basically, if you're living on uh, HTTPS, you can use Service Worker. You can check it. Just type Service Worker on Google. Google will slap you in the face, I guess, because you don't already know what it is. Uh, basically, you will have the control of every single asset that gets downloaded in uh, a personalized cache from which you can retrieve or erase every single asset. And this will allow you to avoid Asset fetching that takes a fucking lot of time. Hey. OK, uh, closing, because I have like, I guess, one and a half minutes, more or less. Uh, performance is a matter of balance. No, it's already gone. OK, perfect. Uh, OK, performance is a matter of balance. You need to stick uh, all the best practice you can inside your project to make it 
two milliseconds faster, but it's worth it. There is no golden rule. You need to, me to measure every single thing. You need to test the hell out of it on actual devices. You can't just take uh, codecs and try on an iPad emulation. You have a Mac under it. You can't just take BrowseStack to emulate whatever is uh, a device because it's not reliable. Uh, and of course, last rule. Try to talk with your designers. <laughs> and the most you can get uh, close to this picture, the better the project will come out. <laughs> uh, some useful resources, you will find it on the slide. Uh, today, there is a Drupal 8 Taming in Depth talk, if you want to follow it. And tomorrow, there are quite fancy things. Uh, one of those are Web Profiler, made by my colleague, Luca Lusso, down there. And uh, are you an alcoholic or a Drupalist? Yeah, we are offering free spritz uh, at the booth of my agency, Wellnet. It's uh, just uh, in the back of the coffee thing where I will go lying now. And uh, oh, snap, and we are hiring. So my boss is fine now, OK? I said we are hiring. You want to live in Italy? Come, we are hiring. <laughs> I need, uh, wait, wait! This was the whole point of the talk. No monkey were armed. <laughs> Thanks, really. Sorry if I've bored you. <laughs>